All right, let's open up our Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. We are past the halfway point in the book of Galatians. We finished chapter 3, and there's six chapters. So we are going to start on Galatians chapter 4 today. When you get there, please stand. And we'll honor the reading of God's Word, and we'll get into the message. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 is what we'll cover today. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of, this, of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this blessed day, Lord. We thank you for the, the godly men in our lives, Lord, that lead us. And, and Lord, we just pray that this morning that, that your word will speak to our hearts and our minds, Lord. We know that uh, uh, hearing and understanding the gospel is, is more than just emotions, Lord. It, it's, it's, it goes to our heart. It goes to our mind, Lord. And, and we just pray that everybody here this morning hears it. Lord, that they hear your word, and Lord, that we soak it in, and Lord, that we, it becomes a part of us, Lord, that, that it becomes part of our nature. And Lord, we just pray that, uh, that what I say is what you would have me to say, and Lord, that, that I forget the things that you don't want me to say. Lord, just help me to speak your word and your word only. Lord, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so I was driving to Carthage yesterday. I was going to Tractor Supply. And I was listening to the radio. There's a station 100.5, and it's actually uh, run by a church in Carthage, Cornerstone Baptist Church. And I was listening to it, and uh, an uh, uh, old evangelist, I think he's dead now, named Lester Roloff. Come on. I don't know if any of you listen to Lester Roloff. And, and I just thought this was amazing because I'm driving down the road, and he says, all right, we're going to turn to our Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. I thought, well, hot dog. That's what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. And so I just find it amazing that, uh, you know, last week we, uh, Paul was covering some baptism in Galatians 3, and, well, we had baptisms. And then this week is Father's Day, and, and Lester Roloff was saying, that I don't know of a better Father's Day scripture. That's what he said. Now, we're not going to dwell on the Father's Day aspect of it, but we will touch it because I'm wanting to just, you know, to teach you the Word here and what Galatians 4 would have to say. And, but I just thought that was interesting. I, I love how God works things out sometimes. You know, how, uh, you know, sometimes when the kid's sermon what lines up with ours or the song choices or whatever, you know, God has his hand in a lot of things. And so as I was driving to Carthage yesterday and I heard that come on, I sat in the parking lot of Tractor Supply for 30 minutes listening to it. And uh, so, and it was good stuff. But uh, we're getting into chapter 4 here in Galatians. And the first couple of verses kind of harken back to what we studied a couple weeks ago. Not last week, but the week before, where it he, where was talking about that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Okay, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. And, and I made mention that there was more to that than what is on the surface. Okay, that schoolmaster is somewhat an unfortunate translation. That instead of a, a, a school teacher, that it talked, it meant more of a servant in the home that had authority over the child. Okay, that servant's job was to teach the child and to raise the child and to train the child, kind of like a nanny or, or whatever, but that was their job. And that person had charge and authority over the child child they punished them they fed them they taught them and so Paul 
here kind of takes that a little further and really explains that here. We see, looking at the context, that that's truly what he was talking about in chapter 3, because he's talking about the heir or the child in the home, and he's got maybe in mention in mind a child from a well-off family, you know, a rich family that can afford to have this servant. He says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the father. And so this little child has to, the potential to rule over the household. And somewhere down the line, he's going to get to that. He's going to inherit those blessings. He's going to inherit the authority. He's going to inherit the ownership of the household at some point, but he's not ready yet. He's not old enough. You know, he's not mature enough. And, and the King James says tutors and governors. Uh, the ESV says guardians and managers. Okay, so he's still under people that have authority over him. And now many use this to, to also, well, let me go back. The time appointed by the Father. I was getting ahead of myself. It says he's under those tutors and governors until the time appointed by the Father. And I, I read this from J. Vernon McGee, and, and I read some other commentaries that talk back to this, and what they're doing is they're referring to a ceremony called the Toga Virilis, which is in the Roman world at this time. And basically, the rite of passage for a young man uh, when he's considered a man. Okay, he's no longer considered a child, he's considered a man at this point. And it was usually around 14 or 15 years old. And I did some research on it, and there's a whole lot that goes in with it. But basically, what he's doing, he puts off, and this is symbolic, he puts off his childhood garments. Now, I can't remember the name of it, but he puts off his childhood garments, and then he puts on the toga, okay, which is symbolic of, hey, I'm a man. Okay, and, and we have little things like that. We don't get as formal as a rite of passage, but, you know, we may look at our kids, hey, when they start shaving, they're a man. Or when they show some maturity, they're a man. And they show, you know, good decision-making ability or responsibility. You know, we, we may uh, use that as a rite of passage. We don't get as formal as they do, but that, that is what Paul is likely referring to when he would be declared a man, a Roman boy would. And some even use this to illustrate, going back to chapter 3, where he says that for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ. And so using that same analogy that where he's putting on the clothes, the young boy in the Roman Empire, the Roman world, is putting on that toga to, to suggest that he's now a man. You know, we as Christians, we become mature, or, or we're no longer children, we, we become heirs through Christ, and we put on Christ. Okay, some, and so some may use that as an analogy, but we have put on Christ when we've been baptized into Christ, and, and that's talking again about, you know, not the, the symbolic baptism, but being in Christ when we become born again. Now, we're as children spiritually, before we're born again, it says that it says when we were children, we were bond, in bondage under the elements of the world. And some, some translations may even say the elemental spirits of the world. Okay, before we know Jesus Christ, we're in bondage to the world. We're in bondage to sin. That's something Paul uses a lot, that we become slaves to sin. Okay, the, and... It, we're looking in chapter 4, it says the elements of the world, and again, maybe the elemental spirits of the world is what some would say. And these are the same spirits, the same things that when we become born again, that we war against, that we fight against, that we struggle against. You know, we, our battle is not with principality, or not with flesh and blood, but it's with principalities and power of the, of the air. And so we have that in our Christian life. So even though we become not under bondage to these anymore, we're still going to have to fight against them. But looking in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. And this is kind of going to illustrate how we are in bondage to the elements of the world. It says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 
among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so Paul is saying there in, in the Ephesians letter, the letter to the Ephesians, that, hey, there was a time we were subject to the prince and the power there. We were children of disobedience. We were children of wrath. Okay, we, we were subjected unto that. But then we become born again. Back in verse 1, he says, You he hath quickened. Okay, he's made you alive. You're no longer dead in sins and trespasses. He's made you alive. And, and it kind of goes back to the, the child in illustration and talking about the toga virilis. We become an heir. Okay, we have been deemed by the Father to be grown people. You know, grown men, grown women. Okay, and, and that's what the toga virilis, going back, that was all according to the Father. Okay, he's the one that said, you know what, this boy is a man now. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, we see that Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. Okay, basically saying, when I was not born again, when I did not know Jesus Christ, I spoke of the world. I thought of the world. The world ruled me. And so we are like that before we're born again. Some people, after they become born again, still kind of try to jump back and forth between the world. You know, and, and it was uh, asked in, in the New Testament, Paul says, how, how long will you go back and forth between opinions? You know, we've got to, when we become born again, we've got to leave that world behind. We've got to leave sin behind. And, and a lot of times we look at, well, that's just too hard to do, or this, that, and other. Paul says, Jesus says, the Bible says, that we can get through that. We can overcome this. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. But looking at verses 4 and 5, and this is the gospel in a nutshell. When the, time of fullness of, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And so when the fullness of time, when God was ready, and, and you know, I don't know if anybody has their has a handle on when, what events had to take place or, or whatever before God said, you know what, it's time to send Jesus. But what we do know, there was sin in the world, people were slaves to sin, and God had ordained from the beginning of time, especially after the sin in the garden, that hey, as there's going to be a point that I'm going to have to send my son to sacrifice himself for the sins of the people. And when that time came and he sent Jesus, made of a woman, made under the law, okay, fully God, the Son of God, and fully man, the Son of Man is what he's called at times, but made of a woman, made under the law to redeem those under the law. And so some people may look at that and say, well, that's just talking about the Jews. They were the ones under the law. But when we look in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, it says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing of or else excusing one another. Basically saying, look, the Gentiles had the law written on their hearts. We know right from wrong, okay? There, there comes a point in time that we understand right from wrong. And we have that law written on our hearts. And we're under the law in, under the, in that as well. And so Jesus came to die for us as well. We know that, okay? We, we speak on that a lot here. We preach on that a lot. We teach on that a lot that Jesus died for all. And so it's not just the Jews, it's the Gentiles. We were under the law as well. But God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so in verses 6 and 7, we get into what kind of pertains to Father's Day. We have been adopted because of the work of Jesus Christ. Looking at Ephesians 2 again, we read verses 1 through 3, and it talks about how we were sinners, how we were fulfilling the, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, 
But in 5 through 7, or 4 through 7, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's the gospel. We were dead in sins. And like I said, no matter what we do, no matter what we have done, we were sinners and God sent His Son to die for us. You know, He's become the ultimate Father. He has given the ultimate sacrifice. And it's all through Jesus Christ. Everything that we have with our relationship with God is through Jesus. In Ephesians 2, in those three verses that I just read, we've got with Christ, we've got in Christ, and we've got through Christ. Everything is dependent on Jesus Christ. You know, and, and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people, they'll say things like the man upstairs, or, or very generically speaking about God, like they don't know Him. Like we know who He is, we know that He created everything, but we don't know Him personally. You know, there's a lot of people that I know of, but I don't know them personally. You can come to me and say, hey, do you know Terry Weaver? She's a representative for our district or whatever. Do you know Terry Weaver? I know who she is. I never spoke to her unless she handed me a card going into the football game when she's campaigning. That's it. I can't say that I know her personally. It's like that with a lot of people. But what God did through Jesus Christ, we can know Him personally. And, and that's what's great about these verses and, and what He's talking about here. Because, because of the work of Christ and because we have become sons of God, God has given us His Spirit. And so in verse 6, he's talking about it is the Spirit that cries, Abba, Father. Okay, without the Holy Spirit, we can't do a whole lot. But looking in Romans 8, and I'm going to read a few verses here, 11 through 17. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, and we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And so we talked about the work of Christ in Ephesians, and here in Romans, Paul's talking about the Spirit. We saw through the Spirit and in the Spirit and led by the Spirit. Okay, we have to be dependent on those things. We have to depend on, be dependent on the work of Jesus Christ, and we have to be dependent on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, or we accomplish absolutely nothing as a Christian. We accomplish absolutely nothing of any value, of any worth in the Christian life without those things. Our life is dependent on it. Our salvation is dependent on it. And where it says it is the Spirit that comes in and cries, Abba, Father. And we've talked about that that Abba, Father is an is a Aramaic term. Abba is. And it's, it's a term of endearment. It, it speaks of basically daddy is what it says. It, it's the term for father, but it, it reveals an intimate relationship with the father. Where we're able to call God Daddy, But it says we can't do that without the Holy Spirit because He sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father, saying that it's the Spirit that cries there. Now it says in Romans that we cry out, Abba, Father, but we cannot have that close relationship without the Holy Spirit. We've got to have that. And once we become born again, He gives that to us. It's, the, it's one of the perks 
of being called a child of God is having that relationship. Okay, things don't start when we die, when it comes to our salvation. When, it, when John 10, we're talking about in Sunday school, that Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. That's not just talking about heaven. Yes, everything will be well and good up there, and we may sing praises to God and, and hobnob with the angels or whatever, but that starts here. We can have our relationship with the Father here. We can know who our Father is here. It, it, it doesn't wait till we get older. It, it doesn't wait till we die. We can have that relationship now, and too many people want to push that relationship aside. It's just like a father-son relationship here on earth. You know, there's a time that the children may be all about their father. You know, I, I've got a daddy's girl, and I'll come in, I'll sit down on the couch or in the recliner, and she'll come and crawl up in my lap. Now, there's probably going to come a time that she's not, that, she's not going to want to sit in my lap anymore. You know, there's a time in a father-child relationship that we may grow apart. And then we may come back together when we get older and we realize we didn't know as much as we thought we knew and what our father would tell us a lot, that he was right and we were wrong. And, and we may try to come back even closer. And, and, and we, we are like that with God a lot of times. We become born again and we are on fire for God. We have a relationship with God. We pray to him, we study his word, and then things die off. And we kind of distance ourselves from him. And, and, and we're not studying anymore like we should. Or we, we may backslide in some certain things. We're not on fire like we used to be. And then sometimes, and sometimes this doesn't happen, sometimes we, we come back to them. We realize what we had and what we have left behind, and we come back to them. And sometimes we don't. You know, I, I've seen a lot of older people that they started out on fire for God, and then they kind of went away and... They never come back. You see people in nursing homes and hospitals that are desolate and went to church their whole life, but they've left that relationship and they don't know how to get it back. They, they don't know how to have that intimate father-child relationship with God again. And again, that doesn't start... The, the life abundantly doesn't start when we're in heaven. We are obligated. We are required. We are blessed that we can have it now. You know, Ephesians 1.13 talks about how we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're born again and God gives us His Holy Spirit that seals us. And You know, it's just like when uh, my children were born, I sealed them with my last name. That people know that they belong to Him. Or some Crosland, that it's Dennis. Okay, that they belong to him. That's my seal on their lives, that they are mine. God has given us his Holy Spirit as the seal in our lives that people are to know who we belong to. The Holy Spirit is a sign to others. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, 12, 13, and 14, it talks about some of the spiritual gifts. Now, in 14, 22, it says, Wherefore tongues, talking about speaking in tongues, are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Now, we're talking about two spiritual gifts here. And they're the, the gift of tongues and the gift of prophesying. Okay, they come strictly and only from the Holy Spirit. And what is, that, what are the, what is the purpose of them? What, is, what does Paul write that the purpose of those gifts are? Signs. That one was for those that don't, that don't believe, the tongues, that, that people can see that and say, hey, there's something going on with that person there. And then the people that believe you have prophesying, that, which is giving them a message from God, but therefore signs. Now, the Holy Spirit in our life may not manifest itself with those gifts, we may have the gift of teaching, or we may have other gifts, but they are for signs for us and for those around us, whether they believe or they don't believe. They are for signs. And so God has marked us with the Holy Spirit. Now, what's great, and I think Melinda somewhat alluded to this, but he didn't, he didn't mark us as our children and then take off. He, he's not an absent father. 
Hebrews 13, 5 says, He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake you. Jesus said in Matthew 28, after he gave the Great Commission, He said, Lo, I'm with you always. You know, we, we may think God has left us. He has not. But there's a lot of times that we leave Him. We walk away from Him and say, God, I'm going to do my own thing right now. I know better. And, and a lot of times, we kind of what I alluded to, we are like that in our relationship with our earthly fathers sometimes or even earthly mothers. You know, we, we have people that may know what's best for us, but yet we think we know what's best. He's not an absent father. He's not a father to be ashamed of because there's not a father on this earth that is perfect. You know, I think, and it may be a rare exception, I think most of us can find faults in our earthly fathers. I know I can. I can find faults with myself as a father. But here's the thing, with God as your heavenly father, the best father you can have, Melinda said he was perfect earlier. Absolutely right. We, there is nothing that we need to be ashamed of. And, but yet sometimes we don't want to acknowledge the fact that he's our father. Now, I, I, have, I have been embarrassing to my kids sometimes and they don't want to acknowledge that I'm their father in public, whatever that might be. I, maybe when I dance or whatever, it's embarrassing. But there's nothing about God that should be embarrassing to us. And Jesus said, Him who confesses me before the world, I will confess before my Father. If you are ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. We have no reason to be ashamed of our Heavenly Father. You know, when we walk out these doors, we have no reason not to tell everybody who our Father is. Let me tell you who I belong to. Let me tell you who saved me. Let me tell you who adopted me as their child. That'd be Jehovah, Yahweh, God. Romans 8, 14 Again, it says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So when He's marked us with that Spirit, we are to be led by the Spirit. All right? We are to do what the Spirit calls us to do. And if we're not hearing that Spirit, maybe we kind of have walked away from our Heavenly Father. We are to be led by the Spirit. And that's whether it's obeying the commandments of God, you know, and, I, and I'm talking more about what Jesus said, love one another, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But looking in the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay, that's saying we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, He is the Christ. It means we're born of God, we're born again. He says, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. We can't keep his commandments unless we're led by the Spirit. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And so before we're born again, we're under the control of the world, the, the elemental principles and spirits of the world. And yet when we become born again, we become the children of God, we have overcome the world. And the reason we do that is because of our Heavenly Father. So why should we not be going about telling people who we belong to, telling people who Jesus Christ is, because they can be overcomers too. You know, we have to keep that in perspective because a lot of times we, we get uh, complacent. We, we don't acknowledge who our Father is a lot of times. And, you know, it's kind of like the teenager that loves his Father but uh, takes him for granted. You know, maybe we're at that point. We take for granted who we have in God. We take for granted who we have in Jesus Christ. And so one thing that having a father does for us is that he chastens us. And this is maybe what some people, why some people neglect their heavenly father. But in Hebrews chapter 12, 
Verses 5 through 11 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So he says, if God is not chastising you, if you're not convicted by God, you don't belong to God. You don't know who your father is. And that's what it says. He said, if ye be without chastisement, if you're not getting chastised, then are ye bastards and not sons. That's what it says. That you don't know who your father is. And so if we're not feeling that conviction, maybe we need to say, you know what, I need to go back to my father where I hear that conviction. And, and you know, we, it's pretty simple and straightforward. That if, if God loves us, if we're children of God, he's going to deal with us at times because we mess up. You know, even, even in Proverbs it says, the father that spoils a rod hates his child. You know, if we don't feel that rod from God at times, that chastisement when we do wrong, then we kind of walked away from God. And in Hebrews 12, it kind of points out the double standard that we have compared to our heavenly father and our earthly fathers. It says in Hebrews 12, 9 says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? He said, Look, you've obeyed your earthly father. You've, you've given them reverence because of maybe the punishment they give or just the status that they have. But yet our heavenly father, who has done so much more than any earthly father could do for us, we don't acknowledge him like we should. We don't obey Him like we should. We don't do the things like we should. We fail to understand that we have riches beyond comprehension. You know, looking back at Ephesians where it says that we have riches beyond measure, that we have salvation, that we have rewards and glory, and we underestimate that. Why? I guess because we don't picture it now or don't see it here. But we have all of that that God gives us, and we want to give honor to our earthly fathers more than our heavenly father. And that shouldn't be the case. We, don't, we want to honor men more than we honor God a lot of times. And why is that? Do we want to go back to being under the world as, as instead of being under God? Which we'll talk about that next week later on in Galatians 4. You know, after we're born again and, and going back to the world. So here it is, Father's Day. And we may, we may not have had a good earthly father. Or we may have a good one. But whether good nor bad, they can't compare to our Heavenly Father. And, and, and here's what I want to get across is that we need to honor Him more than we ever honor anybody on this earth. And, and I'm talking about, you know, and it gets into it later on in Galatians 4 where we honor times and seasons and people and such. That stuff don't matter if we're not honoring God. We ought to give God all the praise, the glory, and the honor. And what He did for us through Jesus Christ and what He did was sent Him to redeem us to save us from being under the world. And, and we can't acknowledge a lot of times what he has done for us, whether it was such a long time ago or maybe we just walk, walk away from him. We have the opportunity every day to thank God for what he did for us. And that will send his son to die for our sins so that we might have salvation because I can guarantee you every one of us need salvation from God. So this morning, as Cleet and Mama come up for the invitation, you know, search your heart. Look at yourself. Are you born again? Do you have that conviction? Do you have that relationship with God as your Father? If you don't, 
Get it taken care of. Come and pray, or I'll pray with you. Somebody else will pray with you. If you've got a, another prayer need, you know, we are here for you. All right? Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid to. Because if, if you're not born again, the best decision you could ever make is being born again. Or if you are and you backslidden, you can say, hey, I want more of God. So the altar is open. Let us stand and sing.